This presentation is on how to cope with split session days, not only from a physiological point of view, but also dealing with the psychology approach. So what are split session days? They're days where you're doing two training sessions in one day. It can be where training is across different modes. For example, this is a regular occurrence in triathlon, where you've got many different disciplines to train for. It could also be in cycling, where you've got weight training session as the second session in a day. Normally, these two training se sessions are separated by a period of around six to eight hours. Why would you use split session days? Well, firstly, it allows you to do more training. So, if you're a full-time worker and have got limited time to train, you may feel it easier to break down what training time you do have by doing a session before and after work. A second good reason is because you can actually train harder in each session. It also allows you to incorporate more variety into your training week. It also allows you to keep up enough volume. For example, during the race season, when a lot of your training is around race pace work, you might want to add a second training session in a day just to make sure you've got enough maintenance of your endurance base. It might be that these split session days are more effective. Recent research coming out suggests that training twice a day might lead better training adaptation than one session. We've actually got a fact sheet on this and you can look it up on our download area. The main physiology behind it is that by training twice a day you might overstress the glycogen storage. Because glycogen stores will be lower because you're unable to resynthesize that glycogen by session number two, you might switch on more genes causing adaptation to be greater than if you were doing the same amount of training spread across seven days. So what are the considerations we need to put in place? You're going to have to consider things like the ordering of sessions, the timing of your sessions, the nutritional strategies around those two sessions, how you might maximize recovery, the mental approaches to the day. And we're going to start with that, the psychology. It's not an easy practice. It's different on a training camp than when back home. Back home, we might have distractions. In many ways, work fills the gap. But what about when all you're doing is the training? Some people take to it, others don't. For some people, the thought of having a second training day is quite distracting and they're unable to relax in between. So, going back to our list, at the top of the list there was ordering of the sessions. The order of the sessions is going to depend on a few different things. For example, what are the aims of the day? and for the two sessions themselves. Is one ride contributing to training volume? Is there a session out of the two that you would prioritise? Also, have a think about what kind of athlete are you? Are you a lark? Someone who likes to get up early and train? Or are you an owl? Someone who likes and prioritises activity later on in the day? Depending on what kind of person you are, you might find a better time to place your most important session of the day. If you prefer afternoon training, you might well find your best place putting your quality session of the day in that slot. All of us also have a natural diurnal rhythm. That is, over any given day, there will be fluctuations in our body temperature, and also regular cycles in our hormone profiles. A good example of ordering sessions and the considerations around this aspect is weight training. It's logical to think that doing weights first 
might induce fatigue and decrease the quality of the second session. And indeed, that's possibly true. But think about the advantages of doing the weight training first. It's possible there's what we call a potentiation effect. For example, imagine the track rider. They go into the gym. They do their squats. They then go out of the gym, get on their bike and do some sprints. It might well be that they've fired up their fast twitch fibres ready for them to take on those sprint efforts. It's also possible that the intense exercise in the gym elevates your hormone profile. So things like testosterone and growth hormone peak and you might actually get a greater training adaptation. Protein repair is switched on by the hormones such as testosterone and growth hormone. How about the timing of the sessions? Again, this is going to depend on the nature of the day's work, the time you might need for recovery. What if your first session is particularly long or strenuous? You're going to need more time to recover before session number two. Also, take into consideration what you've done the day before. Perhaps one of the biggest factors is your nutritional strategies and preferences. Some athletes I work with can't train on an empty stomach. That means their first session is delayed by having to eat breakfast. If you can get out and train before breakfast, you've got longer recovery time and you've also got an extra chance for feeding. Let's think about some recovery strategies. In here we've got to talk about nutrition, the new trends to wear compression gear, techniques such as cold water immersion, massage treatment, using sleep. There are many ways that we can induce faster rates of recovery. Optimizing nutrition is probably the most familiar. We will all have come across this, that protein recovery drinks are the best thing to take on board post-exercise. It's essential to get them down within 20 minutes of the session ending. This has got to be your priority over showering, over cleaning the bike, and even before food intake. It's amazing how many people I see washing down a cheese and ham sandwich with their bottle of protein recovery drink. This just doesn't work. Give time for the protein recovery drink for a head start. Have it pre-prepared in the fridge, get back from your ride, take it down, go and have a shower, and then come back and have your meal. It's not just the quality of protein that matters, but more importantly the speed of absorption of protein. A drink I would recommend is Rego Rapid, a special type of Rego recovery drink from Science and Sport. Look at this table and it might give you an indication as to why you may not want to choose ordinary Rego all of the time. For example, look down the left hand side of this table. Rego Rapid has hydrolyzed proteins. These are almost pre-digested proteins. It leads to the drink being slightly thinner in consistency, making it quick and easy to drink, and actually quicker to digest. Other things included in this ingredient list are creatine, electrolytes, and also vitamins and minerals, all aiming to accelerate recovery and actually help adaptation. What else do I need to consider? really get around big meal thinking. It's better to graze to eat little and often. This not only maintains blood glucose levels but it also helps optimize the resynthesis of your glycogen stores. It's a bit like drip feeding those calories in over time and stopping any kind of bottlenecks. A 
big factor is giving consideration to that late afternoon feed. It is good practice to get another meal in prior to your second session. However, do think carefully about its composition. You're going to need something quite carbohydrate orientated rather than something like proteins or fats which are hard to digest. Compression gear. There aren't many athletes now who don't own a pair of recovery tights. There have been many claims made about compression gear. Improving recovery due to that improved circulation, reduced fatigue, reduced muscle damage, even down to heightened pre uh, proprioception, mainly seen in things like throwing events. But what about the reality? Since their popular use, in the last few years, research has started to turn towards addressing the question of how effective compression gear is. Few studies are coming out in support. One has found perceived reduced muscle soreness after exercise. Another study, looking at the blood lactate response in trained cyclists, found wearing graduated compression stockings during recovery decreased the blood lactate concentration. The main support for wearing compression gear, gear though, seems to be anecdotal. It just feels good. And like anything, the placebo effect is huge. Let's come on to sleep. This is perhaps one of the biggest misnomer of being a professional athlete. Professionals spend just as much time thinking about recovery as they do their training. Being a professional athlete doesn't just give you more time to train. It gives you more time to rest. This is one of the luxury of training camps. It is chance to live like a full-time pro. Having an afternoon nap not only helps you increase sleep in the bank, in the bank but it also allows you to consider optimising physiological adaptation from the morning session. Let's consider what sleep does. You may be aware it occurs in two phases. You've got your rapid eye movement phase and this appears to be really important for the development of the brain. It's the time when you're dreaming, when you're going in and out of deep sleep. Non-REM sleep is really where you get true anabolic processes taking place. This is probably the most important phase of sleep for the athlete as this is when rejuvenation of the organism's immune system, the nervous, the muscular and skeletal operations take place. So the big question is how long should you sleep in the afternoon to get these benefits? Well it seems to take people 20, 75 to 90 minutes to get into non-REM sleep. Alongside this there appears to be a natural release of human gro growth hormone one hour into sleep. Be careful though and exert some caution about using afternoon naps. It's best to avoid it after four o'clock in the afternoon. What you don't want to do is to disturb your nighttime sleep as this has to be the priority most athletes needing about nine hours. Massage is another popular system used by athletes. It's commonly thought to increase muscle blood flow, decrease edema, swelling and pain, enhance blood lactate removal, enhance healing and alleviate any delayed onset of muscle soreness. The reality though is that really it's about decreasing inflammation and pain and also alleviating delayed onset of muscle soreness. 
Some studies have shown that serum creatine kinase and myoglobin concentrations are significantly higher when you've had massage. That shows that you're helping release those materials from the muscle into the blood for clearance. Cold water immersion isn't exactly popular with proteins, but it is used a lot, supported by the Australian Institute of Sport. The left hand picture here shows the recovery unit at the AIS. Contrast water immersion therapy is also becoming popular. Hot and cold water cycles being used. And this has actually been shown to enhance post exercise, exercise creatine kinase clearance, CK being a popular marker of inflammation in the tissue. But what about reducing inflammation? If this is the case, i.e. is inflammation is linked to recovery directly, how about using something such as anti-inflammatory drugs, ibuprofen, neurofen, those kind of things? The research seems to suggest it's beneficial for short-term recovery of muscle function, but the real worry is if you keep relying on this over extended periods of time it might actually have a detrimental effect on the natural muscle repair processes and therefore adaptation to training. You might need inflammation to lead to adaptation. It's an important component to tissue recovery, so why try to reduce it using things such as stretching, massage, cold water immersion? It's an interesting question. So, Having seen all of these things, what's our conclusion? Well, this table nicely summarises things that do work, things that aren't worth looking at, and some things that still need some more research. Things to definitely factor in to your split session day are the afternoon nap, the protein recovery drinks, and keeping well hydrated. It looks like it's worth trying compression garments and contrast temperature water immersion. If you can get your hands on it, cryotherapy. That's actually taking the muscle tissue temperature really low. We don't advise the non-steroid anti-inflammatories, but things like massage, stretching, active recovery might be beneficial. Just to sum up, if there is a psychological benefit, why not use them? If there's no harm, they might be worth giving a go.